In Richard III, we can see how Shakespeare's dramatic exploration of the throne versus the state, war, deception and betrayal, gender and the pursuit of power reflects aspects of the world as it was when Shakespeare wrote this play. Evil, hunchback, child killer, these are all words that are often used to describe King Richard III. He's the English monarch we love to hate. Famous for his cruelty and unfashionable deformities, Richard III has been depicted for centuries as twisted from the inside out. But was he really such a monster? Stay tuned to find out. Let's start by getting reacquainted with our illustrious playwright. Born in the mid-1500s, Shakespeare is the most successful and influential playwright of all time. With a staggering 39 plays and 154 poems to his name, Shakespeare is affectionately known throughout the English-speaking world as the Bard. Shakespeare wrote during the height of the English Renaissance, which was an exciting period of cultural revival in England. Literature, drama and music all flourished under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, who was a great patron of the arts. That's why this time period is also famously known as the Elizabethan era. Many playwrights in this period drew inspiration from classical Greek and Roman texts, especially the tragedies, to recapture the high drama and heroism of ancient times. After all, Renaissance means rebirth. We can see these classical influences in Shakespeare's plays, including in his five-act structure, his fallen figures of nobility, political themes, and the kind of rhetoric or persuasive and powerful language he uses. By the 1590s, which was when Shakespeare wrote Richard III, plays in London attracted around 15,000 spectators a week. Considering London had a population of about 200,000 at the time, that's not a bad turnout. Those numbers alone tell us that plays in the Elizabethan period were not only popular, but they were also powerful ways to shape public opinion. But playwrights had to ensure their plays didn't spread seditious ideas that could endanger the monarchy. Far from being a democracy, Elizabethan England was governed by royal absolutism. This means the Queen, who inherited the throne by birthright and kept her position for life, was in charge. Queen Elizabeth branded herself as a strong maternal monarch who loved her subjects, so long as they were obedient. If they weren't, they would suffer harsh punishments and be made an example of. There's little wonder why Shakespeare's history plays uphold the glory and legitimacy of England's monarchy, especially Queen Elizabeth's family line, the Tudors. Also, most of the historical sources that Shakespeare relied on were biased in favour of the Tudor dynasty. If Shakespeare had portrayed Richard, who was a Plantagenet, not a Tudor, as anything other than a villain, the Bard's own neck would have been at risk. The Tudors rose to power when supporters of Henry Tudor, the Earl of Richmond, killed King Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field. Henry Tudor became King Henry VII of England and was Queen Elizabeth I's granddad. So there's that connection. A familiar sense of royal absolutism is depicted in Richard III, where the commoners know their place. Although the common folk of England are given a voice in the play, it's clear that their lives are at the mercy of the throne. If the monarch is too young, as Prince Edward was, then royal family rivalries can jeopardise peace in the realm. But if a bad egg like Richard rises to power, then bad is the world. War, tyranny and mass suffering will all be on the cards. 
Shakespeare also portrays how easily England's citizens can be misled by corrupt, ambitious men. While Shakespeare might be warning his audience to not believe every political stunt they witness, he's careful to contain this message within the context of Richard's deception. More on that later. Since Richard III is a play that begins and ends with war, Shakespeare wants to emphasise who the winners and losers are. In Act I, the House of York are celebrating their victory over the House of Lancaster at the Battle of Tewkesbury. In Act V, the Battle of Bosworth changes everything. The House of Tudor takes charge and the entire Plantagenet dynasty, including the House of York, goes extinct soon after King Richard's death. The Battle of Bosworth was the last major conflict in the 32-year-long English Civil War known as the Wars of the Roses. This is the historical backdrop of the play, which was written just over a century later. But that's enough history. Let's learn more about the play. With around 52 speaking parts, Richard III is one of Shakespeare's most complex plays. And Richard, the play's dastardly protagonist or main character, is still one of the most prized roles for stage actors. Shakespeare originally wrote the part to be played by London's star actor Richard Burbage. This was the perfect part for Burbage. With his commanding stage presence and realistic performance, he made Richard III a box office smash hit. Since Richard himself is the ultimate actor, deceiving everyone with his dissembling nature and gift for language, the part demands an expert actor. The play's metatheatrical elements, or self-references to theatre, require a subtle skill. The actor must suspend the audience's disbelief while emphasising the way Richard enacts various roles. He plays the part of a loving brother, caring uncle, passionate lover and loyal subject of King Edward. Perhaps the most famous example of metatheatre in the play is when the Duke of Buckingham stages Richard's appearance to the public, making him look like a devout Christian and reluctant to accept the crown. What a performance! The other major challenge for any actor playing the part of Richard is the physicality of the role. Shakespeare depicts Richard as a hunchback with a pronounced limp and deformed arm. So not only does the actor need to deliver Richard's lines with spellbinding intensity, but they also need to think carefully about how they'll move while speaking. Richard's deformity is the basis of the play's best insults and is one of the things that make him such a memorable villain. But there is evidence to suggest that Shakespeare over-exaggerated Richard's disabilities. In 2012, the remains of King Richard III were discovered underneath a car park in Leicester, England. In a spooky twist of fate, the car space directly above Richard's grave was marked with an R for reserved parking. It couldn't have been scripted better. What the archaeologists found was that Richard did have scoliosis, or curvature of the spine, but he wasn't the bunch-backed toad we've imagined for centuries. They also couldn't find evidence of a withered arm or cause for a limp. Ultimately, Shakespeare emphasises Richard's outward deformity to dramatically symbolise or represent his inner corruption as a deceitful Machiavel. The word Machiavel derives from the name of Italian political theorist Niccolo Machiavelli. His most famous work, The Prince, circulated widely in Elizabethan England so it's highly likely that Shakespeare was familiar with it. A Machiavel is someone who puts morality aside and does whatever is necessary to secure their power. According to Machiavellian philosophy, 
the odd act of cruelty is okay when you're on the path to power and glory, as long as the cruelty is well used. Some call this the basis of modern political science. Others call it plain evil. Shakespeare's best villains often use Machiavellian techniques to get their way, but we all know how that usually turns out for them. When Richard takes the stage in Act 1, Scene 1 of Richard III, he's got Machiavel written all over him. His opening soliloquy reveals his determination to prove a villain because he cannot prove a lover. Remember, a soliloquy is when a character on stage shares their innermost thoughts with the audience. Shakespeare uses this technique to draw us into Richard's twisted inner world where deception and betrayal are mere tools for advancement. Remember, Richard is a great actor. He fools almost everyone into thinking he's harmless and misunderstood. But among those who aren't fooled are three strong female characters, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Margaret, and the Duchess of York, Richard's own mother. In fact, these ladies have a major impact on the outcome of the plot. Queen Elizabeth tricks Richard into thinking she'll put in a good word for him with her daughter, Elizabeth of York. If Richard marries her, he could secure his claim to the throne. But instead, Queen Elizabeth pledges her daughter's hand to Henry Tudor. Not only did Queen Elizabeth's sleight of hand affect the outcome of the play, but it also affected the course of history. Then we have Queen Margaret, the widow of the last Lancastrian king, Henry VI. Her hateful curses against the entire House of York in Act I start to come true. As they go to their deaths one by one, many of Richard's victims regret ignoring Queen Margaret. But it's the Duchess of York who gets to say the lucky last curse. Having known all along that she birthed a monster, she finally curses Richard to die shamefully in battle. It doesn't take long for that one to come true. Unless you were the Queen, women in Shakespeare's time lived within fairly restrictive boundaries. Elizabethan society was patriarchal, which means that men held the money, power and property. Women could not own property, attend school or university, or enter professions. However, women in the upper classes could be very well educated at home if their families could afford it. Queen Elizabeth herself was homeschooled by one of England's finest scholars. Her wit, intelligence and agency are reflected in the characters of Queen Elizabeth, Queen Margaret and the Duchess of York. Whereas Lady Anne's character reflects the more common scenario of that era a woman being a man's property. The way Richard seduces, marries, then murders Lady Anne is all part of his ruthless strategy to win the throne. Richard's pursuit of power totally corrupts him, and while his cruelty gives him short-term gains, he is unable to maintain his vice grip on the throne. By the time he's crowned king in Act 4, Richard has had his brother Clarence assassinated, caused the death of his own brother, King Edward, executed at least four noblemen who stood in his way, imprisoned his own nephews, and begun planning their murder as well as his wife's. Ultimately, Richard is condemned as a villain, and everyone celebrates when he's killed in Act 5. Richard's violent demise reflects King Richard's actual death in 1485. But its dramatisation as a ghostly prophecy harks back to the classical Roman tragedies. Shakespeare uses this ancient but entertaining stage technique to condemn Richard's power grab as an unholy act. But was King Richard III really all that evil? 
Well, he did have a ruthless streak, that's for sure. And the whole thing with princes in the tower still makes him look very sus. But nowadays, there's a growing movement to rescue Richard's reputation from history's bad books. During his brief two-year reign, the real King Richard III made significant social and legal improvements in England and was generally considered a competent ruler. Once his pursuit of power rewarded him with the throne, he seems to have used it well, at least in the Machiavellian sense. By the way, King Richard was the last English monarch to die in battle, and it's widely reported that he fought well and died bravely. Upon learning of King Richard's death, the city of York went into mourning. So while Richard III draws on historical events, it's more the product of creative genius than meticulous scholarship. But as Mark Twain once said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Great job, team. In this lesson, we've covered how aspects of Shakespeare's context are reflected in his dramatic portrayal of the throne versus the state, war, deception and betrayal, gender and the pursuit of power in Richard III. You're now ready to write awesome paragraphs and make Shakespeare proud. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.